Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, it's an honor to introduce uh, Ben. Um, um, ben is an associate professor at, um, of course, we have people coming in. Um, ben is an associate professor at Berkeley, at the ECS department at Berkeley. And uh, um, Ben uh, actually is a graduate from MIT. He spent uh, 2000 to 2006, I think, at the MIT Media Lab. And uh, so should be proud of that. We should be proud of that. <laughs> um, and then uh, you spent uh, three years at Caltech as a postdoc. Uh, spent your, you started your faculty um, academic career in a University of Madison, um, Wisconsin, and um, then moved to Berkeley, where you sort of uh, been that's fundamental research in understanding the relationship between controls and machine learning. Uh, sort of looking at those feedback loops that happen or may happen when you have a system that is learning uh, through experience. And uh, he has received many awards, out of which maybe I'll just like highlight one. In 2017, he got the uh, um, Test of Time Award at NIPS, which is awarded to a contribution from 10 years earlier, if I understand correctly. Uh, I don't know if how many of you have read uh, and how many times you've read the, uh, the paper, uh, Random Features for Large Scale uh, Kernel Machines, and, uh, which was awarded in 2017, written in 2007, a paper that clearly uh, um, sort of helped define a generation of people that worked in uh, machine learning. Um, and I would be curious maybe later to hear what are your thoughts of how things have changed since then. Uh, how many people use kernel machines uh, or how much have we sort of still embrace uh, those lessons. Um, but I think that the, the one thing that I really wanted to say today to introduce Ben is that uh, he's an avid, avid communicator, right? Like the, he does uh, the excellent efforts in just communicating research uh, in very different avenues. So he teaches many courses on um, optimization or machine learning or just statistical learning in Berkeley. Um, he has given many, many, many talks. Like if you look at the list of talks in his CV, uh, you can spend like pages just going through, skimming through. Um, it just gives you an idea of sort of his um, investment in communicating ideas. Um, but that's not it, right? So he has a very followed Twitter account where uh, with uh, in the order of like 11,000 uh, followers, which uh, helps create many debates in the community and uh, start many uh, discussions. And um, maybe the last part is that he, he has a blog where he sort of uses to um, explain some of his ideas and um, try to, uh, at least that's my impression, try to write in very simple words complex ideas, um, both from uh, ideas, academic ideas, but both from a technological perspective or scientific perspective as, as well as humanistic perspective, right? So he has uh, posts in his blog like, um, you cannot serve two masters. Um, the harms of dual affiliations or sort of trying to explain what it means for academics to have a food here and a food there and sort of his perspective. Uh, but maybe the most important one is a 14 part series, um, uh, the, um, an outsider's tour of reinforcement learning where he tries to explain that intricate relationship between um, um, the machine learning community and the controls community, uh, both from a scientific perspective, but also from a humanistic perspective, right? Like all the wars that happen instead of taking credit for uh, great ideas. And uh, how, do, how do we, what do we do to, mer to merge them and put them together? So I think that um, that effort of trying to distill complex ideas and put them in simple words to sort of broaden the community that can access to those. Um, I, to me, it's one of the uh, most noble arts of uh, an academic. And I think that Ben, with his efforts and his dedication to that, sort of embodies that 
um, like view. So thank you very much for coming. Man, what an intro. <laughs> Alberto, thank you for a wonderful intro. That was really, that was really kind. Um, yeah. I will say about my Twitter account, my, my, my number one rule there is never tweet. So I break the rule a lot. But yeah, that's the goal. Um, so today, so as Alberto mentioned, um, I've been uh, interested in reinforcement learning probably for about half a decade now. Uh, it actually hasn't been a very long time, but uh, uh, I feel now I've just realized that it's become much longer than I thought it, it would be. It was the thing that uh, there was a lot of excitement uh, at Berkeley about this. There was a lot of things that seemed to be happening, and it's just something I kind of wanted to get my head around. Um, over that time, I really feel like we, I, I learned a lot. I figured out a lot of things about what are our challenging problems. And what I want to talk about today is something I just don't have a solution to. Um, and, and, and so this is going to be a weird, it's a weird talk. I've given it a few times. I'm still trying to figure out how to do it, where it's like, I want to talk, tell you about stuff that I don't know the answer to at all. And I think it's really a pressing and challenging problem uh, for us as a community. Uh, to, today and tomorrow, there is a uh, conference called LIDS at 80. It's a retrospective history of, of the Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems. It turns out it hasn't been named, it's only been named LIDS for 40 years. It's, the original name was the Servo Mechanisms Lab, which is amazing. <laughs> I really feel like maybe we, we need more labs of servo mechanisms. In any event, uh, but it's a crazy, it's a really interesting to look at the intellectual history of MIT and to see all these things that have happened. And we just had a discussion which closed with Sanjoy Mitter suggesting that perhaps what I'm going to talk about today is one of the grand challenges in that space. So I was like, amazing. And I should have told Sandra to come, but anyway, yeah, he's busy. Uh, but we'll see where that goes today. I feel like, I, to me, it was like, I felt better about the talk after hearing Sandra say that. I'm like, fine. If Sandra doesn't know how to solve it. That means that we have a real problem here. So this is joint work. It's been with a lot of great people at Berkeley. Um, we've been, go ahead, man. AV problems. Got it? Got it, okay, AV problems fixed. So there's been uh, a lot of uh, interesting work with great people at Berkeley. Um, it's actually a nice collaboration between Francesco Borelli's group and, and my group and a bunch of really smart and enthusiastic students and postdocs. Um, okay, so, so, right. Why did people get excited about reinforcement learning? I think that's, let's pinpoint why. Uh, it was hard to kind of separate what was supposed to happen and not happen, I think, in, at, when was this science paper? Does anybody remember? Someone said 2017, but that seems way too recent. I think it was earlier, right? It was like 15, 2015, right around then. And people started, why, why do we get excited? Well, one, because people thought Go was hard. That's fine. Two, we were in the middle of a deep learning revolution. And um, uh, three, so people thought you could use learning for anything. And I think three, people started to do something where they were taking, they were really, uh, having a lot of success in fusing kind of complicated sensors like cameras into robotic systems. So I think there were like three things kind of floating around each other. And you wanted to figure out what exactly, what part of this is actually the part we should be taking home. Okay. So also to be fair, because there are people in the audience who know this, we've been interested, reinforcement learning is not five years old, right? It's a long, there is a long intellectual history of that as well, much of which had been done at MIT by various faculty. But I think, you know, for a long time, um, it wasn't part of a mainstream excitement. And then for some reason, in about 2015 or 2016, reinforcement learning was going to solve every problem. And how we made that jump from niche subject to like the solution to everybody's problem is an interesting thing. Why did that happen? I'm not sure. Uh, the other thing that happened at, uh, that I think never happened and I think is really challenging is that uh, while reinforcement learning works in games, which are beautiful closed environments with very well understood rules, uh, in robotics, I think the wins were a lot less uh, grandiose, even though they would make it, you know, you could get uh, places like DeepMind or OpenAI to suggest that we were a step away from artificial general intelligence. And we know that, like, these robotic systems that we'd want to actually put out into the world, they have to be robust and safe before we're really going to actually put these in mission critical tasks. So one thing that we were also very interested in is, like, how do you actually take, what are the wins that we could take away that we can put into robust engineered robotic systems and autonomous systems? Um, so uh, my lab invested a bunch of time trying to just get at like, what exactly is the thing that makes this work? Where, where is actually the, uh, 
where is actually the kind of nugget of, uh, 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 of something that's different than things we already knew before. I'm not gonna talk about a lot of that, so hopefully people maybe saw, I've, I've given a few tutorials on that perspective, um, both on this blog that Alberto po uh, pointed out. I have a survey that tries to sum up some of these that was published uh, in the annual reviews of control of robotics and automation last year. I gave a talk at Coral about it and a talk at ICML, which are both online. So I'm not gonna talk about any of that stuff, other than to say that once you start looking under the hood, a lot of this stuff doesn't work. Just a lot of this stuff doesn't work, and the promises are a little bit grandiose. When you start to get down to it, you're like, what actually works? Why are people excited? And I think the thing that made people excited was that they were using cameras with robots. That seemed to be the really salient thing. Even in Go, right? At the end of the day, the main revolution in Go, like the big thing in Go was realizing that I could take a picture, I could treat the board as an image, and then just predict the next board, and that would be like three Don amateurs. And then from there, you add tree search, you do all this other stuff, and all of a sudden, you're up to nine Don. But the main, that first insight was I could just treat this as an image and predict the next image, and that was already a huge leap over where people had been. So that was, a, that was amazing. And then, of course, there was maybe less amazing things that people could solve Atari. I actually don't think that's as impressive. But since then, people have done a lot of cool stuff. I got a picture from Alberto's lab here of being able to actually use vision in the loop for doing like, complex processing and sorting and grabbing and manipulation. Right? So trying to have that be part of the sensing technology. And like you said, cameras are amazing sensors, right? They are, you know, you get millions of time series per second to process which is wonderful. So instead of, you know, in, in most, when you take a signals and systems course or a controls course, you know, when you say multi-input, multi-output, you usually mean five, <laughs> but here we have millions, okay? And it's a different kind of setting, what, what multi means. Um, and I think, I think, I just remember, and I was trying to come back through this, like the thing that seemed to really capture this imagination is this idea of policies that would map pixels to actions, okay? And that was the thing that was exciting. And the question is, what's the right way to do that? What's the right way to put pixels inside of complex feedback loops? Um, and this is the question I don't have a good answer for. So I want to talk about some things we've been thinking about in the space, how we've been thinking about it. I don't think any of them are at all final answers, at all. I mean, they, I'm not even sure they're first answers, but they're just trying to poke at a little bit what's, what makes this hard and how actually can we start to um, make progress towards understanding it. Um, so let me begin, okay, so let me get us to that question. Let me get us to that question. So I, have, I usually use this, uh, this silly cartoon in a lot of my talks where we say, okay, uh, how do you actually go and control a quad rotor? Okay, everybody knows. You wanna move the quad rotor from point A to point B. You write down everything you know, which includes Newton's laws, that you know, acceleration uh, is the derivative of velocity. Velocity is the derivative of position and uh, F equals MA, right? I mean, these are the, we, we write those down, we write down a few other things about the actual geometry and shape and moments of inertia of the quad rotor, and, and then from that, we maybe solve an optimal control problem, right? And there's a lot of work, uh, both from the theory perspective, and this is actually what I was hinting at, a lot of stuff that my group has done as well, um, trying to understand what's the right way to solve this problem, which is a Markov decision problem, when I don't know the dynamics. Now, what I want to say today is I don't think that problem is actually that interesting. We've been doing a lot of work on it. I think a lot of the uh, fun demos in OpenAI Gym like to approach things this way. But at the end of the day, I told you it's Newton's laws. Most of these things you know. You get down to, like, there's parametric uncertainty. It's a real thing. But we know also how to tune parametric uncertainty. Um, now, the other thing is we have this crazy assumption here that I measure state. Right? And in all of these things, we measure state. And how many systems do you actually measure state, man? Really measure state, right? So the crazy thing is, I'm gonna go to a much harder problem. Um, like, the question is, do you need sophisticated learning in MDPs? And I would say no. If you measure state, system identification is least squares. And we've been, spent a lot of time showing that actually just least squares is optimal for this. No matter what situation you put yourself in, it's, you're not gonna beat least squares if you're measuring the state. That problem's too easy. That problem's too easy. And we've known that. Standard engineering, standard engineering works, so it has to be true. So, uh, but, uh, but it was kind of, you know, making that formal, I think, was important. To want to make this hard is you, you say, instead, I don't actually observe state. I observe a picture that's a function of the state. Okay, now I have a weird problem, right? And all of a sudden, I've gone from the case of an MDP to a POM DP. Because I have to figure out some way to go back from, I, I mean, I know people like to say, some people say, I've... Uh, 20 megapixels, and that's over-redundant, so I have a complete capture, copy of the state. I do not think that is helpful. 
you do not want to have 20 million dimensional states. That's like, that's too high dimensional. It makes control impossible. So we actually have the, uh, every, most of the problems that we have, especially if you're working from images, are POMDP problems. To be completely fair, as soon as you have a state measured with noise, it is a POMDP problem because you have to filter to estimate your state. So POMDP problems, I actually think, are much more prevalent. And so is pixel-driven control actually well modeled by MDPs? I would argue no. You could, and people do when they do these Atari things, take a chain of, of uh, you know, these very highly pixelated small images and then make predictions, and you could do that. But for the most part, especially in robotic systems, like, we know all the state. We know what states are important to be able to do the kinds of things we want. Not always. Like, there's exceptions to this. But like, the challenging part is actually fusing some of these more, these, these more complicated uh, sensing modalities with that kind of state representation. Um, and I, I, can't, I can't say this enough. This is um, actually Leslie is not here. But she wanted to make sure I told everybody this again, <laughs> so that like as soon as you have imperfect state information, you have a POMDP problem, POMDP problem, not an MDP problem. Leslie would go even farther than I would. She would say that if you uh, if you have a game that can maybe be an MDP, then everything else is POMDPs. And you got, everybody who knows Leslie knows that she would say that. <laughs> I'm not putting words in her mouth. Okay. okay, so lastly, one other thing that I wanted to point out as a challenge is that um, most people, when they do uh, these complex things with, with cameras, just take like a standard off-the-shelf deep net, plug it into their control system, and then assume that machine learning is going to help them, right? And actually, I think there's a really weird, subtle thing that happens once we start putting machine learning in feedback loop. And actually, why I like this problem so much this particular problem of that when you have noise in your state is that, or when you have perceptual sensors, uh, is you see how quickly our IID view of machine learning breaks. Machine learning, hopefully everybody's taken a course in machine learning, and hopefully they tell you, the promises of machine learning and learning theory are actually super weak. I think we've solved them. I do think that machine learning is effectively solved. And I think machine learning was effectively solved in 1970, and we can talk about that at the reception. I don't think anything really has changed from our initial view. Uh, but I think, so the main difference between, um, so what machine learning promises you is that if I sample a bunch of data from a distribution and then do something, minimize empirical risk, that I'm going to perform well if I sample from that distribution again and then evaluate, okay? But there's something weird there. Like how, why, as soon as you stop sampling from the same distribution, machine learning doesn't work anymore. And there's another line of work I'm not going to talk about today where we've been studying how quickly those kinds of shifts can happen. Um, and I think I, I, if you uh, plug that paper, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we have a paper where we recreated a test set for ImageNet, and you see that even trying to recreate somebody's own rules for sampling from a distribution causes distribution shifts that have very, very large unexpected errors in the models that were trained on the one set. So these distribution shifts are real. And if you do something where you train some robotic policy using your vision system and then turn the vision system off and deploy without the vision, you have a different pol you're, you're using a different policy. So some of the work, uh, some of the, the, I mean, work I really like by uh, Chelsea Finn, Sergey Levine, Peter Abiel, Trevor Darrell on doing what's, uh, they, what do they call it, guided policy search, uh, is they actually train an optimal controller first using um, knowledge of where everything is, and then they turn that off and just use the camera itself. Um, and that is deploying now a policy that is different than what you were using when you were collecting the data. And so the camera is actually seeing something that are, are immediately outside of policy, and you have to account for that. Okay, so standard generalization actually does uh, uh, not work, and we need something else. So we have some issues. One, MDPs, which I have spent the last five years thinking about, which is great, don't necessarily solve all the hard problems. They don't get us everywhere. And pixel driven control in particular is, uh, is probably not going to be best modeled by an MDP problem. I would also say that that first one was amazing to me. If we spent five years working on this, we wrote all these hard papers, we bashed our heads against the wall, and like, look, what it looks like now, there was a paper at the last Colt by Stephen Tu, Horia Mania, and myself, which essentially shows that for, for linear control systems, the best, and MDPs for linear control systems, the best thing to do is you take some data, you fit your model, and then you treat the model as true. Like, that's optimal. Prove that I, I think um, I don't see Max or Dylan here. Max Centuris uh, and Dylan Foster just proved this mini max optimal, and that's crazy. I mean, of course, it's what we've been doing since 1920. I don't know a very long time. It controls, but it's interesting that from the perspective of MDPs, that problem is is relatively straightforward. And all the extensions, the tabular cases, you see the same thing. 
um, to nonlinear things. We, we never have guarantees, but I'd be surprised if there was something amazingly different there. Um, but these other two things are big problems. How do we actually deal with this kind of um, imperfect measurement, and how do we actually uh, quantify errors? And so I want to just kind of look at a simple case today. Again, I think these are huge problems. As soon as you say POMDP, everybody should be terrified. Uh, <laughs> everything is hard as soon as you move away from MDPs. And so I don't have good answers, but I want to talk about one simple, one relatively simple thing that we've done that we're looking at. Again, I do not believe it's an answer at all. I want to show you a demo of us trying to do it, which I'm amazed that it works, and that's cool, uh, and maybe where we go from there. Okay, so let me give you an example. This demo will be at the end. But uh, Francesco Borelli, for his undergraduate course in uh, vehicular dynamics, built this cool platform called the Berkeley Autonomous Racing Car System. Uh, it is, it, it, what do we have on here? We have a, well, we put a camera on it. They don't usually have cameras. Uh, it has a, a dumb IMU, some encoders, and an Odroid. It's a really cheap, janky remote control car. Autonomous driving. <laughs> it is. What's nice is if it crashes into th something, nobody hurts, and nobody cares too much because um, Vicky, the student who's been doing most of the engineering on this, calls this car Oscar because it belongs in the trash. Uh, <laughs> so it's really, it's fine, it's fine. We, we, we love Oscar, he's been good for us. So uh, let me give you a, a goal to do with this kind of car. It has very limited sensing capability and I'm gonna actually cripple it. I'm gonna put, tie his hands behind his back. I wanna actually have this follow a demonstration and find the optimal way to kind of trace a demonstration as fast as possible. Um, only given one demonstration and only using the sensor I wrote here. The camera and IMU and the encoders. Okay, so no external, no, no global positioning system. Okay, and so, you know, this is what the, that web camera sees. This is the Wozniak Lounge at Berkeley. Uh, and so from images like this and the wheel encoders and the IMU, can we actually give a, uh, get a, get this thing to actually follow that trajectory and do something faster than the initial driving? And it's challenging because there's no depth and all the coordinates are relative, okay? So it's not, I mean, you guys, I know you guys can do this. I'm not saying you can't do this. I wanna say, what does this highlight, all right? I'm sure anybody here, you give you uh, that platform, well, actually, probably not that platform. You would build a better one, it's MIT. So you would build a better car platform that would solve this problem, you do it in a weekend. But still, let's just think about what's hard and what makes this problem challenging. And really, the reason why is we'd like to scale this to something more interesting and more large scale, right? So um, Francesco does a lot of this stuff on real cars, uh, on um, a couple proving grounds where they can actually learn to improve maneuvers in real cars um, using a variety of sensors, but they're using much more, much more, uh, much better, more accurate state estimators. Um, there's also a bunch of people, there's really great, this great platforms. It's funny, th this car, is considerably more robust and heavy duty than ours. It's this really cool, uh, if, ever, if anybody's visited Georgia Tech, they have a really cool dirt track where they race these things. Uh, they cost a lot more, that's how it goes. Um, they have GPUs on board, it's nice. Uh, and then there's also, I, everybody should, there's great work done by uh, Scaramucci's lab at uh, ETH where they actually do racing with quad rotors. I think racing, racing is one of these things where I don't actually think it's a like, real application, it's fun. There's fun things that could come out of it. Drone races are obviously gonna be cool. But I think it has a lot of the character of a lot of robotics applications, and it brings a perception in a nice way as well. So I think that's kind of why uh, it's nice. And the videos are, their videos are better than mine, but that's fine. They have really cool videos. You get nice demos. Um, and it highlights a lot of the issues. Okay, so how do we model the abstractions of doing this kind of autonomous racing? Now, um, let me give you a, a, a bit of it and we'll give you one view. So one thing would be, you have some unknown locally linear dynamics. I actually do believe, and in this case, we do have unknown dynamics, and the biggest thing being the tire forces being the hardest thing to identify. Um, you have some observation model, which is a camera and some other sensors, and then uh, our, our model is that you also have this thing that takes whatever comes with the camera and gives you back a state estimate. It doesn't even have to be a state estimate, honestly, it just has to be a estimate of a linear function of your state. So for example, it could just be position estimate without the velocity, right? Something like that, okay? So we get some kind of measurement. So, so we're mapping back to what would be, this would be linear control after applying the perception, but we have this error term that's induced by the fact that we're using perception, okay? And quantifying what the heck that error term is is actually most of the problem. And it's weird. It's weird. If you look at the errors that come out of your SLAM system, they're weird. They're, they're a little bit hard to, to follow. Um, then we plug a, we build a controller around that, and that is our, that's kind of one abstraction for this problem. 
And in particular today, let me just ignore the, I'm going to, at least for now, ignore the fact that we have to learn the dynamics too. We do it in practice. I don't really know how to think about those things together, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, what's wild about the fact that we have to learn the dynamics is that you're never getting, I mean, maybe it's not that wild, but you're getting an output. All your outputs don't have any, there's no global grounding. They're just what your perception system tells you. So you have to learn a dynamics model from the output of your, I'm, I'm saying slam, it could be a neural net, it could be whatever the heck you want it to be. Random kitchen sinks, I don't care. But <laughs> whatever is the thing that maps camera images back to these positions. Okay, so we wanna say, we're gonna uh, make the machine learning basically black box. This perception thing is our machine learning, and I'm not gonna talk much about what it does. We're gonna try to quantify what comes out of it. Um, and then we want to understand how we use, if someone hands us this black box that they've tuned, uh, it, it's either, actually the two things, we've looked at three things, random kitchen sinks, somebody's neural network, that again, they've trained from images, or uh, it's just orb slam, one of those three. Um, and then that thing, all of those will give you some kind of position back. And then what does this tell us about how we do a learning and control code design? Okay, so in some sense, and I think Russ would be thinking this immediately, he'd be saying, look, this is just output feedback, and this has been studied for since the 60s. Uh, a lot of the development was here, I learned this morning. No, I know that, I knew that already. But it's always fun to hear about the, the origins of robust control and how, how MIT was connected to them. Um, and so it is just kind of, we have a state that evolved according to time. We want to minimize some cost. In this case, it would be some cost to go around the track. Uh, we have some linear, observation that is corrupted by noise, and we want to build a uh, controller. And so if you wanted to do this, what is, what's the problem? The biggest problem, well, it's actually, it's, honestly, it's a little weird, to be totally honest, right? Solving optimal control in this setting is a little weird. Um, I think most people should know that LQG is much harder than LQR, or is much less robust than LQR. It's also harder, fundamentally. You have this, you, all of a sudden, you have this thing where I just take my state and apply, you know, you have state feedback. And then when you do LQG, what is LQG? LQG is just doing linear quadratic problems, but now I observe things through some Gaussian process instead of perfectly. At that point, now you have to build a Kalman filter, and then you take the output of the Kalman filter as true, and you do state feedback, right? That's the optimal solution. It gets more complicated. As this noise process gets more complicated, obviously things get more complicated, and the hard part here is just figuring out what the heck this E is, or quantifying what, what, how can we talk about the E. So, Here's a model, and this was actually the hardest thing for us, and we're st I'm still not happy about this at all. It's like once you even just decide that that's the problem, it's like now how do I model the noise? Okay, so what I have here is that the EK is gonna be, you know, there's this H, which is my appearance function. I do not remember why I called it H, but fine. H lifts, the, it's just because F and G were taken, I guess. H is gonna lift things up into the high dimensional space. So every state corresponds to some image. And then maybe that image is noisy, and that noise depends on the state, and maybe we have some other noise there. This is like too much crap, but it's fine. I just like, we could put all sorts of stuff in the appearance. And then your neural network, your orb slam, your whatever, maps you back into some function of the state. And the error is just how off are you from that CX, okay? And we're gonna say, I shouldn't have this be equals. Well, no, I can have it be equals, it's fine, this is nice. The nice thing about adversarial noise models, it's some, uh, linear, some matrix times your state, so it's a linear function of your state, I don't know what delta is, and that delta can be time varying. But I just wanna say it's some kind of map, it's some kind of state related quantity, and then noise. That, now that's the adversarial part. So it's, it is equal, this eight, so you can see that the balancing these two things actually is what makes it kind of complicated. I could put everything in eta, I could make something here, I have to make some assumptions about how all these things play together, and I think that the, the way you make those assumptions and the way that you Quantify those assumptions is actually what makes this really challenging. So, being a control theory minded person, what I would say is that you have this idealized system, which will just take uh, will will just take this error and give you a beautiful model, and then the perception errors are going to come in. Right? Instead of having this thing actually give us perfect state, we have this thing kind of introducing these perception errors, and I've just drawn it as a block diagram. I don't know if there are any control theorists in the room. Go ahead. Exactly, that's what the state, the, that's what the, no, but you're saying that I could actually index it by state. Yeah, but this is a linear. Yeah, that's great. 
No, this is just going to be, I'm going to show you how we do it in this case. We're also, we're not sure what, what we're trying to figure out right now and what we're, try, we're trying to quantify is what's better. Because it's definitely true, you've done SLAM before, so it's definitely true that SLAM is not spatially homogeneous. And we're trying to actually quantify that and come up with a good model. I think that the next revision, this, we have a, a version of this on archive. The next version of it is going to have a very different error model, to be totally honest. Because I think this is not as realistic as it could be. This is just trying to account for the fact that if you go faster, you're going to have blur. And I would do something like that. It's not going to account for the fact that you have spatial inhomogeneity, which is definitely a real problem. But do bear with me, because I think that the treatment, at least what we try to do, I think does carry over. OK. Um, So A is like the part that we're just going to say is bounded. It's just bounded. So that's why we'd like to have this thing that's state dependent to not have because if you just want it, you could just have one bounded unbounded error. And we're not we're, we're, again. These are the kinds of things I just want to show. There's lots of choices with how you model the noise and actually how you fit that. And that's what we're still trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. And I think spatial inhomogeneity actually does seem to be bigger. Well, you'll see at the end. The, the, the complicated thing is blur is actually not doesn't seem to be the issue with velocity. It's just dropouts. I'll show you that at the end. So you get quantifying the error, the hard part, and then you can build some stuff around it. OK, okay and so here's what, OK, I just want to give, let's see. I don't have a ton of time, but let me give you a very high birds level view of what we're doing here. At the end of the day, with this thing, what we came down to, again, is that we're doing control with these kind of um, these disturbances mapped in, and we want to build robust control around it. And I have a, a way of doing robust control now that I've been trained by Nikolai Motney, who is now at Penn, to do. I like it a lot. I think that the way that these kind of errors that come from things in machine learning propagate come through in a natural way. I feel like there's lots of other places where this is not the right thing. For some reason, the kinds of errors we get introduced by measurement error seem to be able to, we, we be, are able to handle them more transparently in this framework. I do not believe it's the only solution, though. I just can think about it better. So that's, let me just at least tell you the way we think about it. You don't have to think about it this way. I just want to tell you how we think about it. Russ is skeptical, but it's fine. I like, I like this view. So here's, the, here's our classic view, right? Also for me, it's like I get to be a convex optimizer again. The classic view of things, uh, you, have a, you have this abstraction box. I want to design k. Everybody knows that k is just going to be some policy function. But of course, this is immediately not convex. Even in a linear case, it's not convex if you write things this way. This is known in robust control. And most of robust control is fancy tricks to make things convex in one way or another. I like this particular fancy trick. It's actually, uh, it's, there are traces of this idea throughout the control literature. It's just not the most popular thing. But if you look at like Doyle, Francis, and Tenenbaum, they do this in the first chapter, which is to say that I can actually think of the whole thing as a big system. Right? When you talk about well-posedness of an interconnection, you are thinking about the whole system and a global view rather than the local view. So in particular, if I have my controller be a linear, time-varying, uh, possibly time-varying uh, function of the state, then the map from the disturbance to both the control and the state is some convolution. Okay. And so I could, the system actually is completely determined by that convolution. I never have to know anything else other than what those phi's are. And so I can just think of the whole global system as some map that takes disturbances and maps them into these internal configurations. Okay, so that, this is, again, not new, but what's nice about this is that you can actually, and this is also not new, this is, again, it's in the first chapter of Doyle, Francis, and Tenenbaum's feedback systems, is that now you can look at, like, compositions of these maps to get out what the controller in the real world would be. In this case, and this is kind of obvious, if you take the map that goes from state to disturbance, and then the map from both disturbance to output, that seems like the composition of those two should be your control, and it is. It's like, so it turns out it is. It's so like you invert the, uh, the, X, the, map that, the thing that maps disturbance to state, and then you multiply by the thing that maps disturbance to, um, uh, out to, to controller. And that actually is the, the realization that you would use in the world. And so what this lets us do is you take this original optimal control problem, where maybe you want to enforce some safety, maybe you have robustness issues, maybe you have uncertainty, and you map it into this kind of high dimensional but uh, convex uh, problem with these mappings. And so this is called systems level synthesis because you, you synthesize the, the convolution operators and then you take those out and you build the thing you would build in the real world. So it's, it's kind of a nice way of lifting this thing into this higher dimensional space, um, working with essentially, as some people might, this is essentially a juiced up version of what's called disturbance feedback. It's nothing, again, it's nothing new, but it's powerful. It lets us be, uh, make everything convex. And I think because of that, it lets us be very transparent for how the errors propagate. Um, 
So what we do in the case when you have an output is, again, all we care about are these maps between the disturbances and the state and the uh, input. And so your perception errors here would be eta. I'm lumping everything into eta now, just to make my life easier. Your disturbances for your model are w. OK, so that would be your equation errors. And then I just have to make this matrix that maps these disturbances to x and u. And uh, it turns out that you could get this affine, there's an affine set of uh, things that are realizable that map to actual implementations. I could write those down if I know A, B, and C. And then I can, again, now it's more complicated, but I can construct out the controller from the phi's themselves. And what's cool and what we use, and I think that there's lots of, th the reason why I like this again, is that when you want to be robust, what you could do is say, instead of saying I have a perfect A, B, and C, let's imagine I have A plus delta A, and B plus delta B, and C plus delta C. And we were talking about delta C. This is why it's kind of like it's coming up. Now what you can do is you say, I just actually do synthesis treating this as true. Treat the A, B, and C that I fit as true, and then account for the fact that I'll have a delta. And this is the, this beautiful thing I, I love about uh, system level synthesis. In this case, we're only looking at C plus delta C. And it turns out you get some new delta out. This is some operator. It doesn't really matter. But you have a, some term here. Multiply. This phi hat is saying, let's take the models as true, even though we know they're false. And saying, how do I have to now transform them to get the actual realization when I go to the real world? Is you end up multiplying by this map I minus delta. And if I can quantify the size of this delta, I can now quantify the suboptimality of this solution. And that's, that's, kind of the, that's why I like SLS, is because you always get equations like this. And usually, it's just by dumb linear algebra. And then now, you know, if I want to bound the norm of this, I bound the norm of this one times the norm of that one. And if I want to bound the norm of 1 minus delta, you know, you know, we know how to do that. Or like sometimes you'll get a 1 minus delta inverse. Again, you start to play these kind of rules. Okay. So we're using this lemma from a paper by Ross Bosar, Nick Montney, and myself in this paper to deal with the delta C. And so as I said, like, uh, the actual map is I minus delta times phi hat times uh, W and eta. And so now we can actually see how the trajectories that are realized, the true trajectories, are this. And so we can see how the true trajectories uh, arise as the design system response the actual noise, and these kind of these errors in perception. And the errors in perception are all in delta and eta in this case, which is cool. So OK, so now you're like, OK, I should be done. But this is where the machine learning comes in. And this is where or the generalization error comes in. And this is what's weird. OK, so you take this thing, and you have these perception errors. And you, build, you synthesize your controller using those perception errors. And now the question is actually, how do you show that the new controller is actually going to respect everything, because I have, I have perception errors that I have in my loop. Yeah, Ron. Isn't that thing all closely tied to what? The cost? What cost do you want? We do all, we do, I mean, so the, uh, no, so what I, we are actually do, we, uh, see the skip slide? <laughs> Unskip slide. So just for us, I had that right. So there are lots you can do. And they really just depend on how you want to characterize the different disturbances. So typically, the objective is, dis, uh, is how do, it, it's related to how we think about the noise. So LQR tends to be things where you have, you're thinking you have either sensor noise or some kind of natural stochastic process. You could do worst case. We could do L1. I actually think L1 is actually surprisingly useful in a lot of cases, because like for, for saturation limits, L1 seems to be like the right model. But we can do, it's just a norm. You end up just having a norm, and then you have to just propagate the error through it. So you can treat them all. It's whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Yeah. It, oh, for your cost? It probably does. So I think you have, these are both design decisions, though, right? Which makes it aggravating, because everything now is coupled. Yeah. Um, where was I? Get back out of here. Oh, it's down here. Okay, but this okay. This did bring me to this idea of generalization. So, right, the, the classic machine learning I've, I've mentioned this before has this annoying property that, like, the generalization results on the, when we rely on like statistical arguments about closeness of the training and test. And you assume the same distribution, and the thing is, as soon as you have a closed loop distribution, so you, you collected this data in open loop somehow, or with a different sensor, I put things in closed loop, but I have a different distribution, um, and so you end up kind of moving from the cl something close to something far away. And the, the, I think the most important thing in our paper, and the only thing that I think is probably really 
because we've, we've done this in these different settings. Russ is asking about what costs we look at. A gentleman in the front here is asking about how I actually model my perception errors. In both cases, actually, the, the way that we actually prove that we get suboptimal but not terrible control is to leverage this idea that I can actually build a controller that keeps me close to my data. I could build a controller to say, stay, so you know that if you put this controller out in the world, it's gonna do something different. I'm gonna see different data. So you can actually impose as a design, and impose as a constraint, I should stay close to my data. I should try to make the controller move into parts of space that I have already seen, which is weird, but at the same time, that's kind of what we want to do. We don't want to be surprised. We don't want to be surprised. We would like to be boring. And so the way that that actually pops up in our theory is that you end up having this thing which says control. You want to really make sure that the uh, mapping from the sensor errors to your state, which is something, again, this is one of the design variables, those are small. And they're bounded by these things that depend on the noise. And again, this is the part that will change. You change your homogeneous noise thing, whatever is on the left-hand side is going to change. Go ahead. I guess I have a question. Yeah. This is assuming sort of what you see is dependent on your state. But like most of the things we worry about is like if you saw something crazy that rose, it doesn't really matter if you're driving in the middle of the lane or on the left or on the right, because there's a crazy thing there that you can control. That's right. So That's right. I'm not talking about that problem today, but I do think that this, this gets you there, right? So if you build a controller, that's designed to stay in a regime of things that you believe are true, and all of a sudden you get a spurious sensor measurement that doesn't map to what you saw before. Shouldn't that be a good signal? I, I, about it. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. That's a great question. That's a great question, because I, th I totally agree. I totally agree. That's, I think, where you want to go, right? It's hard to simulate those things. And I don't think we want to rely on simulation to, like, I really do not believe in this, this mindset that we just capture all edge cases by by simulation, and that will solve our robust control problem. And we know that's not true, right? Because like Tesla had this thing where this guy drove his car under a trailer truck in Florida on a two-lane highway when the truck was taking an unprotected left. And then two years later, then some guy drove his car in Florida under a truck uh, that was taking an unprotected left in Florida. And it's like, you saw that edge case already, guys. I mean, that's kind of dark, dark joke there, because both of them died. But still, <laughs> it's like, uh, anyway. OK, so let me not go. Um, so basically what this means is that now we're kind of stuck with how we train these things. The training actually has to be done in this way where either you have a dense sampling of the space, so then I can stay close to my sampling. For racing, we could probably do that as long as the track doesn't change. Or again, for racing, imitation learning is a possibility, where you want to stay close to the things you've seen in previous laps, but you can improve as you move along. And indeed, that's kind of the demo I'd like to show. Um, let me skip out of that again. I forgot which slide to go to. I'm going to skip. These simulations are boring. This simulation is less boring. So <laughs> let's go back to this one. This is actually like a, in, here we're trying to fuse a bunch of these things together. It's not perfect synergy, right? I, as everybody knows, right, the theory and practice are farther in, well, well, actually, I don't know. Are they farther in practice or in theory? We'll see. We'll see. But we're fusing a bunch of these ideas together and trying to bring these two worlds together. So in particular, for, for, the, for this, car demo that we did, um, we build a single imitation, a single thing to track. And that actually was really important. And we do see as, as you try to move this thing away from your demonstrations, like everything goes to hell. So we have one demonstration from a human. And then we use, the, the way this works is you use two laps to generate more data that I could follow. So some says, while the math isn't quite the same for our synthesizer here, you'll see in a second, we're doing something. We're going to do, we move to MPC, of course we do. Because <laughs> you go from beautiful control theory to MPC, because of course we do. But the, 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 the lesson from generalization stays the same, which is that I start with data that I get from a human, and then I use, the first step is to do something dumb and slow to get more data that I can stay close to. Once I have that, I now do this, what we implement um, what's called learning model prediction control, which was a, this is a brilliant idea by Ugo Rizzolia that I feel like everybody should know, so I wanted to talk about it. It's like one of the most amazing reinforcement learning ideas that nobody in reinforcement learning knows. So I want to at least talk about that very briefly. To, I'll show you how we do it. And, and we kind of are just, at this point, just using a smart data structure to stay close to the data. Uh, we are using OrbSlam. Here we're recording more data to stay close to the data. And again, what you'll see in a second is, again, is using previous data to stay close to the data. In all of these cases, what we're trying to do is stay close to what we did before and allow ourselves a little bit to, to uh, inside that uh, boundary, doing a little bit to add improvement. So it really is just kind of this imitation learning setup that I was talking about. Let me skip SLAM. You guys all know SLAM, right? If you don't, we could talk at the reception. Don't want to go through SLAM. I did want to talk about error. And why are we not using a neural net? I don't know. 
they're, they're, I, we could. I don't, I don't care. I mean, actually, okay, we're, we're not using a, learn, a neural net is because I don't know if you guys know Vicki Yi, graduate of MIT. If anybody met, met Vicki before, she's amazing. She worked with Bill Freeman. Bill has induced some biases, so she doesn't like neural nets. So <laughs> we'll blame Bill. No, actually, I don't like neural nets either. It's also, I think people have just, I don't, SLAM is really good for a lot of things. So we'll just stick with that. Anyway, it works for a lot of things. So iterative learning MPC, I just wanted to tell you about this. Everybody should know about it because it's amazing. Standard MPC, hopefully everybody knows. You want to maximize reward subject to your dynamics. And what you do is you build this terminal constraint, somehow this magical terminal cost function that induces robustness and allows you to work on short time horizons and extrapolate to large time horizons. That's standard MPC. This Q function, your terminal Q function, you usually design. And there's lots of tricks for designing it. Uh, there are whole books about it. This is this kind of like the goal to make MPC really robust is how you pick that Q. Learning MPC learns the Q, learns the Q function. It is a Q learning algorithm, but does not look at all like standard Q learning. It's really beautiful. The idea is you let SS, your safe set, be the set of all the data you've ever seen before. Since we're doing an iterative task, we actually know what the value is, because you know how long it takes to get to the end of the task. So I can always have the value, which is just the last trajectory you did, if you saw that safe point before, because okay? there's always stuff that you've been previous to you on this track. right? OK, so what you say is, I have to land in a safe point, and the value is just whatever the value was there before. And so I'm just constraining myself to land in a state I've seen before, but in between I can explore. And this is super weird. The exploration is now just saying, I give myself a horizon to explore, but I want to end up somewhere that I feel like is reliable. And that, that's kind of our area of learning NPC. It's such a brilliant idea. I love this idea. And it works really well. Um, and it is like kind of the, it's like weirdly, this kind of queue learning is the opposite of standard queue learning. Because standard queue learning explores in the queue. It tries to visit places, it uses queue and says, where am I uncertain about queue? And I go to places that I haven't been before. Here it's saying, no, you have to, you have to only go to high certainty places. And I'm going to allow myself some exploration before I get there. So it's just a weird turning on the head. And we haven't been able to find a good connection in most reinforcement learning, including all of Dimitri's book. <laughs> we had to look through it. OK. Um, and so for the autonomous racing, the cost that you have to get for co is actually really nice. It's just the time to get to the end of the track. That's pretty easy. You pay a penalty one if you're not at the end. You pay a penalty and then zero once you get there, right? So that's the way that, and so you want to just minimize the amount of time it takes to get to the end. And I, don't, I, w I did want to, I don't want to talk about this too much, but I did want to say that while we can write down the vehicular dynamics, we never use them. We just fit. And this is another part that I do not understand, but we put it in there because it works so much better. Rather than having this nice model that we know, um, we fit all of the tire forces and this complex interaction between the headings and the v velocities uh, and this other weird thing that with the moment of inertia and uh, like governing the, the yaw of the car. We fit that all. Just like look at the previous data we've seen before and fit locally linear dynamics. And then we'll, we'll take these guys as given. This is just conversion from local to global, so that's fine. OK, linear lies again. OK, so we, oh, there's a video. Great, there's a video. So here is the car driving in the lounge. I'm going to have to fast forward over one part in a second. All right, so this is the first demonstration given by the human. And uh, this thing is actually annoying to drive, so it's slow. <laughs> it's, 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 it's actually not as easy. And so this is what the dashboard looks like. Poor Oscar. I always talk, I say so many mean things about him. This is the kind of thing that you're seeing. Obviously, there's a lot of good clutter in this room, so it allows us to get a lot of key points for SLAM. Right, you guys can probably see where those are. I should have done another jump cut. There it is. Key points, obviously, on all the table legs. Right. By the way, that white rope in the middle was there for Vicky, because she's driving. It's not there for, it is really just there to have, the, the car never sees it. You'll see it's never in the frame. So the white rope is there for us and for Vicky. It's actually not part of the card has no idea it's there. OK, then we have this first thing where it does the PID lap. This PID lap is super, super boring. Uh, I can't remember how long it takes, so I'm going to skip to here. Now we learn for previous lap data. Some parts of this video, I mean, I will, if you guys want to stick around at the end, I will show it to you. But what I wanted to show you here, these green dots are the things out in front that we think are safe. And those are the places it's trying to go. And the red, hair, the red heading is the trajectory that it picks to explore. So what you're seeing there is the green places are places it thinks it can go. The red heading is how it's trying to optimize to get there. 
and is stitching through initial, the red that's going around here is the initial training data. Okay. And finally, how long do I have to go? And there's some more data, and I think right, I'm just gonna let it go. And here's after 20 laps. Here we go. <laughs> Got my cue. Now it drives much faster. And there you now you see actually it's trying to extrapolate a lot further into the future. And I think what also is fascinating here is like we gave it a certain amount of space it could drive. Like we said, you have to stay inside the blue. So we draw the red, and then we draw a tube around the red. And it finds that actually it's much better to not fall. If it wants to just minimize the time, it's much better to create this weird ellipse. It's well, not weird. Increase the ellipse instead of the initial trajectory, which I think is fascinating. It just learns it. And this is what the camera view looks like. Again, this is the main sensor. I think it's going to show it. There is Vicky. <laughs> and there is, and now like, you'll see the dashboard camera. And as I mentioned before, watch, watch how it flashes. So we're already starting to see the state dependence here. It's not, it's not like there, there's a blur effect. Is that there, you lose tracking effect. So try to actually quantify what's happening in the sensor is something that we're doing right now. Um, I'm going to skip that one. And just in case you don't believe me, we did it in a different room. You can just go, do, we did this in three rooms. Here's room two, driving around. It does work in different environments. Let's just put it that way. We didn't just do one room. <laughs> yeah. OK. Um, Russ is right. It does, it, has, it does have a Kalman filter inside of it. Yeah, so that's fair too. So as Russ is saying, it's, it's not using the actual car dynamics. We didn't plug that in. But it does have this kind of um, smoothing, the kin kinematic smoothing. That's uh, Newton's loss. So that is a fair point. That is a fair point. I could turn it off, though, if that would make you happier. We could do it with it turned off. I don't know. Um, let me just, just real quick. OK, so how do we sum this up? OK, I do think there's something interesting about trying to understand the uncertainty of these perception maps as a visual sensor. And I think that the main thing that we, that we found that's interesting is that not, I can get suboptimality guarantees, and I can get some kind of predicted safe execution as long as I don't try to be too crazy. And that the perception still will be a bit of a hand time. This, these sensors are not panaceas. We still kind of have to hand our, ha tie our hands, because sadly, what we're handed from machine learning is that I can only replicate that what I've seen before. I think knowing that and knowing a little bit about how to do the uncertainty quantification does allow us to use these sensors. So how we go beyond that, I'm not sure. Um, we have this one idea. We like the system level synthesis idea. Um, we know, like what's in, been interesting in the group is we figured out kind of nice ways with the same framework to kind of include all of these things. Although it starts, to, you know, if you have all of these things, maybe we shouldn't be deploying a robot, uh, <laughs> but, to, but in, di in different ways. Um, I do think that the hard part, and we'll sh we're still nowhere near close, is really understanding what the right way to do this last one is. I feel like the uncertain dynamics and, the uncertain, and, and safety constraints, these are things we can handle. They're the things we can do. The, uncertain uh, the perceptual sensing is a huge one. Uh, and also dealing with the fact that your perceptual sensor is supposed to be designed, as we pointed out, as some, my friend here in the front has pointed out, it's supposed to be designed to also be able to give us error signals. So is there both, I mean, most people don't use cameras to guide their low-level control. That's kind of insane. We're doing it, though. That's fine. Let's just see what happens. That's what we did today. Um, but we do use cameras. We're supposed to use them for detecting static objects that possibly shouldn't be in our scene and moving them out or getting out of their way. And I don't think we're anywhere really towards understanding how to integrate the low-level control um, with those kind of detections in a, a safe and reliable way. But that's why life is exciting. That's why we have lots of things to do. Uh, I just want to close with one more thing, which is a plug for the fact that many of you may have came to Learning for Decision, sorry, Learning for Dynamics and Control 2019. Learning for Dis Dynamics and Control 2020 will be in Berkeley. I just want to give the plug. We're going to take accepted, uh, we're going to take uh, contributed submissions this time. So if you have something that you think is cool that you would like to share, please consider sending it. The December deadline is not November 15th. Oh, I forgot to fix that. I should fix that on the fly. Let's say is December 6th. Sorry. Man, that was, this was an ambitious early version. 
things take a longer, but yes. But so they're just six page papers, they're extended abstracts. Um, we're gonna have the best ones, the ones we like the most, we'll get orals and then everybody gets a poster and we're excited to see how this goes. All right, with that, I'll stop, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Two questions about the error. So you had the term C times X mm -hmm. plus eta. So first, your system is nonlinear, so you are basically controlling a local time variant. Yeah. So when you just, your X is large, first your nonlinear terms are also come yep. into play. So that CK is a second order term, so why do you consider that to begin with? If your X is large, the nonlinear terms are also an error. And my second question is, is, so you talked about eta is a bounded error? Is it like a, do you consider like a ellipsoidal polytope or is it, I mean, if it's coming from a neural network, is it something more uh, weird? So I know other, other people have asked, it. so when it comes from a neural network, what is the error? Let's start there, does anybody know? Nobody knows. So I think this is actually a great question. Honestly, even, I'll say this, even with Orbslam, or just normal slam methods, what the errors look like. Under Gaussian assumptions, they're kind of easy to write down. Under real assumptions, when you kick them out of a camera, I, they don't look Gaussian. And they're spatially, they're definitely not spatially homogeneous. So actually, I think quantifying what the heck se perceptual sensors are doing is super, super interesting and super hard. Uh, I think this is kind of like the next step of what we do with these things that are learned. From, quantifying them with data itself is also really hard. It's something I would like to do. Uh, with regards to the nonlinearity question, I will say that we're trying to account for part of that in the delta of x. Um, the other thing we're doing, right, we're making these local linear assumptions, so it's not like we're linearizing around an equilibrium. But in the car, what you saw is that we, we, look, we would only do a linearization over the last two laps. So we're, throwing, so we're only linearizing at the higher speeds, um, because otherwise, you're right, I mean, the errors get really huge. <coughs> Yeah, go ahead, Russ. So if you I'll repeat the question. Uh, sorry. Okay, that's fine. All right, so uh, with your orb slam, you're, it's like you're taking and sticking a Kalman filter in a priori, right? So, so if you if you took an LQG problem, yeah, and you imposed your perception system as your Kalman filter, yeah, and you did SLS, yeah. on that, would you get K? Would would you get LQR out? That's an awesome question. Okay, so the answer is, okay, sorry, let me put it this way. If you do SLS and you solve LQR in the standard thing, you get, uh, sorry, if you do LQG and you solve it using SLS, you do recover the separation principle. This is where, with you imposing the Kalman filter. No, without imposing the Kalman filter, it's the with quadratic here, costs and Gaussians. Right, right, but, but here the analogy is you've written in the Kalman filter. That's your orb slam, right? Oh, my camera on. There we go. Huh, sorry, what was the question? You've a priori constructed your Kalman filter right. into the now problem. Right, that's a different question. So now, right, we know that the, Kalman, the, the separation principle, which is like what everybody does, is what everybody does, and it's cool, right, and it's a brilliant idea. Who's, who do we attribute that to? I always forget. Huh? Simon? Is the, he, he got, he, okay, so, what, but the idea is, and it's for LQG. I was gonna say Kalman. Okay, yeah. okay, but for LQG, but this, probably Kalman, right? I was gonna say maybe Willens, but okay, anyway, it's old. But the idea, the, idea, the idea is that, right, so, amazingly, the structure goes filter, Kalman filter, and then treat the, the optimal solution is do a Kalman filter, treat the, the output of the Kalman filter as true, and then do state feedback. That's the, and that's just a miraculous thing that happens. In most systems, we do that anyway. We build a filter that gives us a state estimator, we treat the output of the state estimator as true, and we do some kind of optimal control around it, right? It's kind of what we do. We can, using SLS, bound the suboptimality of that. So we can incorporate that model. We're not doing that in, what, in the demo. But, I, you, I, but you're asking SLS to solve an output feedback problem here. And it does not give you a state, it, it does give not you, give right, you a you time problem. varying ever crap out, right? The, the, the K that's coming out of SLS is a more complicated thing, It's right? much more complicated. Well, it's it much it more should, complicated, it's more setup, complicated. It should it's, converge to the K from LQR if that was, it so does if right you have thing. quadratic, if you have the H2 cost, if you have a quadratic cost, and you have, and you're assuming Gaussian noise, that's, that is what SLS gives you. But if you don't, so you put in L1, you get a different solution out. Well, that, yeah. You get a different solution out, yeah. It's still something you can implement, and it will be a, some kind of filter design, but it's more complicated. 
Yeah, K is, K is not a, a matrix. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, okay, first question is, okay, the question is, in Q-learning, Q-learning comes from MVP land, which depends on states. So how the heck do you actually use Q-learning ideas when you have outputs? Uh, great question, and, and my question to you is, why can't you? I, I'm just a little confused how this first part of the talk is uh, Good, that's great, that's great. So okay, we can come back to that because maybe I wasn't clear. The first part of the talk and the second part of the talk are not connected yet. And I think that's really the important part. No, no, there was, what, what connected them? What connected them, Nima? Ah, oh, you were asking, all right, sorry, I didn't say it clearly. The only thing that connected the first part and the second part, really, was the fact that the only thing we could do is imitation learning. And I think that was actually, it's actually, it actually informed the design, because we got stuck a bunch of times here trying to do this. It's really the only thing that kind of connects those two and the thing I'm really trying to connect together. The theory says all that should work is either you completely densely sample any kind of point of existence, which to be fair is the Elon Musk model, uh, or it's also the Waymo model, to be really fair, right? So Waymo and Elon Musk say we map everything. Dense, you, complete coverage mapping of everything, all weather conditions, all animals, all obstructions. Okay. Or we imitate things that we've seen before. Uh, that's what the theory said. That's the only things that we, we could bound, and we could construct examples where you don't do that and everything goes to hell. Uh, and that's how we kind of, that actually led to the engineering design of this system, was that we tried to put everything in as close to an imitation learning setting as possible. Now, how do I actually start to connect everything back together? We'll get there. We're not there yet. So sorry, I, I should have, that was kind of the point of this slide. The only thing we know how to do is imitation learning. And actually, if you look at all the other racing examples they give you, that's all they do too. So there is something, I mean, there might be something there. Yeah. But again, I don't have answers yet. Any other questions? If not, I guess we'll continue in the reception. Okay, great. Outside. Thanks. Thank you very much.